Tough competition and technological changes on track to shake up the value of the telco space, according to analysts over at Morphic Asset Management, in particular Telstra. Well, let's turn to someone who's been tracking the growth of the sector for a little bit more analysis, and that is Morphic's head of research, James Taylor. James, appreciate your time today. What has your concerns about Telstra? Good afternoon, James, and thanks for having me on. Um, my concern is that at face value, Telstra has a high dividend yield, 10%, and I think, you know, relative to um, the rate of return on your cash in the bank, about 2%, the dividend yield on the broader Aussie market at 3.8%, um, this looks really attractive, but mm. actually um, the market's um, implying that this is somewhat unsustainable going forward. And would that be, would that be your take as well, that the likelihood probably of a, a cut to that dividend? Um, I think there's a, certainly a risk. We don't have a particularly uh, a, a position um, in Telstra currently, but if you consider um, that the business is not growing, management yeah. is doing the right thing, it's investing outside of the Australian market, but the top line is not growing, and it, at the same time, management has to invest. Mm. And investment plus the dividend yield is equaling, if not more than, the, the cash flow that the business is currently generating. And that's unsus unsustainable over the longer term. It's certainly unsustainable to, to gear up, to, to borrow more money to pay the dividend. And investment has to be a priority given the competition. We've seen uh, Focus and TPG um, and the, uh, the MBN. Um, clearly, Telstra management have to in, in, in invest. And I think, um, given the trends of higher leverage um, and a top line that isn't growing, there, there has to be a risk that div the dividend is cut at some point. That's, I would have thought, uh, the, the conundrum for, for uh, Andy Penn over at, uh, at Telstra. On the one hand, you've got you know, a board, you've got shareholders crying out for earnings growth, but at the same time, you've got this almost sacrosanct um, dividends, which, you know, the majority of shareholders very much uh, desire and, and want to keep. But in this sort of lack of top line growth, can you keep both? Can you do that big investment while also delivering on the dividend? I, I don't believe you can. No. And, and at, at part, the, uh, the regulators, um, one of the main protagonists here, because the regulator has prevented, over time, Telstra from, from benefiting from its natural monopoly position. Uh, you know, Telstra earns very high, compared to many other industries, very high margins and consequently a high ROE. That mm. is, a, that is a, a big catalyst for new competition. Whether that competition is successful or not over the long term is another matter, but competition comes in. Plus you have technological change, which is something the management can't control themselves. The fact is mobile telephony has cannibalized fixed line telephony. The fact is that internet now allows free telephone calls. Yeah, there's many things there out of, out of management's control. Um, so I think you know, they should be pragmatic. And, and, and at the end of the day, private investors particularly should be uh, aware of the fact that a high dividend yield is one thing, but if the value of your capital is falling by more than that dividend, then that's not a good investment for them. Can I ask what you make of, of um, the stated, he stated it a number of times, the ambition of the CEO, Andy Penn, to be a... Um, a global tech company, the idea of moving beyond, you know, the idea of Telstra being a, a leading telco and being a tech company. One thing to say, I imagine a rather different thing to actually achieve. I, th I think it's fine to have um, such a grandiose um, strategic target, but at the end of the day, um, it comes down to capital allocation. Yeah. Uh, he can allocate capital away from the core business. But for instance, if the competition in, may make a move into, say, the fifth generation of mobile telephony, if Telstra doesn't, they'll lose that business. So th their hand is forced. They have mm. to in invest. And maybe Telstra has some, some, some intellectual property, property in-house that's, that's worth a lot of money. And at the same time, you know, they should perhaps consider monetizing that if the mm. opportunity uh, lies there. But at the end of the day, it comes down to um, good capital allocation and the decision-making framework around that. And, and in, investors have little choice but to, to trust management in that. James Taylor, you guys are generally, generally globally focused. What about, I mean, do you, do you take a look at the global telco space? Are there options within that rather large area that does take your fancy, whereas Telstra doesn't? I mean, it is, it is a, a, 
a, a very large area on a global basis, and it's it's an area that, quite frankly, investors have done done well to ignore for the last uh, <laughs> four or five years. Um, that said, there is a niche within um, the telecom space that is uh, satellite companies that we think is particularly interesting at the moment. Um, these are companies that. Um, effectively have an oligopolistic position. Um, they're up there in the sky and um, as opposed to, let's say, the MBN, which will only reach those, um, those towns, cities, where it makes economic sense to put the fibre in the ground, the satellite companies have an infrastructure that can reach 99% of the globe. And that positions them for not only serving uh, mature econ economies, but also the emerging economies, Africa, Pacific Islands, for instance, where it just doesn't make sense to, to put fibre in the ground. And do you look at those global telco stocks that do have an increasing exposure to emerging economies as they build infrastructure, infrastructures, population growth, and more and more you know, want to get that sort of uh, technology in their hands? Uh, we do look at them, and uh, as I said, the satellite companies and, and, and others that, that might be providing the social benefit of, of, of allowing populations that have, quite frankly, not been served with tele telecommunications and particularly broadband internet. Um, I don't think you can argue that it's not a, a, so, not a, a socially positive thing to do to, mm. to, to allow those emerging economies and, and populations to, to access something that we take for granted, quite frankly. Right. James Sally, got to leave it there. Brilliant to talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. James Taylor there from Morphic. Look, while we're talking about...